thank you all for coming and thank you for the invitation. I think it's great, uh, a great opportunity for me to get to talk to you all. Um, just a big disclaimer, I'm just a journalist. I'm not a technologist, so I'm going to try to do my best to show you uh, the tech and the stack we used to, to uh, work on the Panama Papers. Uh, if there are any immediate questions, just raise your hand and I'll try to answer them straight away. Uh, we're also going to have a, a, a part for questions at the end, okay? Um, and excuse me if I don't use like the exact, exact, exact terms. I'll try to do my best. If you want to follow the presentation, I don't know how much you can see it there, but there's a link that it's public on the internet, bit.ly forward slash ICIJ underscore J on the beach. So it's pretty easy uh, in case you have your computers and want to follow um, that. So I'm going to talk to you about the tech we used to work with the biggest leak in journalism in history. And I work for a place called the ICIJ. What is the ICIJ? Well, basically, we are a network of journalists all around the globe that work together on cross-border stories. Our aim is to be the world's best cross-border investigative team. Um, and you can always learn more about us in our website, although I think that the best way to know about us is uh, through our work. And I don't know if you remember The Simpsons, um, this character that said, you may remember us, may you remember me from, well, you may remember ICIJ from previous stories um, that have to do with, um, with leaks. Um, and of course, we also work with public data, but I think that the biggest fame has came to us um, thanks to working with leaks that had to do with the world of offshore, this parallel economy where the biggest uh, and the most powerful people in the world uh, basically hide their assets for different reasons, but that is perfectly legal. So you may remember us from a leak uh, we worked on an investigation we did and published back in 2013 called Offshore Leaks, where we had to deal with 260 gigabytes of data that exposed um, people who had created companies in tax havens. And this had a second part um, that was uh, connected to China, and we published in January 2014 uh, an investigation into how Chinese clients, clients from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong used tax havens. But we've been working on different topics from the, this parallel economy um, based on, on leaks that we've received. And, it's mainly we have to work with leaks because there's no public information about this. What tax havens provide is secrecy. And what we're trying to do with these electronic leaks that we received is to expose this secrecy that economists and that experts worldwide have been saying that shouldn't be secret because we're talking about a corporate world, we're talking about companies, and information about companies should be public. Uh, and again, that's not my opinion only. It's also the opinion of experts from the World Bank, from you know, um, even governments that say that you know, in here in Spain, you go to the corporate registry and you can find information, same in the UK, in company's house. Well, that's how it should be in uh, tax havens, but it's not. You cannot go to most of the corporate registries in these places, and I'm talking about places like Panama, like the British Virgin Islands, the Cook Islands that we talked about yesterday in Data Beers, or you know, uh, the Cayman Islands. Anyway, we, deal, we had to de deal back in 2013, 2012, 13, with 260 gigabytes of data. Most of you may think, hey, that's not much. For us, it was like, oh my god, this is too much information to deal with. Um, later, uh, we exposed uh, another investigation that had to do how big corporations um, used uh, Luxembourg to uh, cut on their taxes and pay le less taxes back home and had cut secretive tax agreements with the Luxembourg government, and that was an investigation called Luxembourg Leaks. And we also, our biggest leak project before the Panama Papers was called Swiss Leaks. A uh, um, computer engineer that used to work for HSBC got a copy of the HSBC uh, client database, and he gave it to the tax authorities in France that um, had started working with that. Uh, HSBC in Switzerland only, and we later uh, got a copy of that uh, at the ICIJ through French newspaper Le Monde. So we exposed information on more than 100,000 clients um, that had bank accounts in Switzerland, and some of them were actually um, doing illegal activities with that money. But of course, even though you may remember us, if you have good memory, you may remember us from all of that, 
Uh, probably what you know us from is the Panama Papers. And just to give you an idea of scale, this is the difference of what we've been working on. Basically, you also have the idea of like the size of um, WikiLeaks, the cable gate. The other you know, dots in, in, in black are basically the size of the previous leaks we worked with. And around a year ago, we were facing this problem. And I am the head of the data and research unit at the ICIJ, which is basically a mixed team of programmers and journalists working together to try to um, provide tools and do analysis so that we could do better journalism. And my reaction when I saw that, I'm like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Of course, the second reaction is, yes, this is great. This is going to be great. And I knew from the beginning, around a year ago, when we started working in this investigation, that it was going to be a big hit. And what was inside those 2.6 terabytes of information? It was basically allowing us to go inside the machine of how this offshore world works, inside one of the biggest companies uh, whose mission is to create companies in tax havens for the rich and powerful in the world, people connected to 200 countries in the world and that uh, were connected to more than 200,000 companies in 21 jurisdictions. But before I tell you how we tried to mine that big thing, uh, I want to tell you how everything started by showing you a video. Angel, play it, please. Okay. Uy. ¿Le das a la siguiente? There's a next slide. Es que se queda colgado. Tienes que, tienes que, como, dale, recarga la presentación si quieres. Y vete a la siguiente. Ay. Pero vete desde la slide de, después del video. This is great Google slide presentation. Sin problema. Yo te, te voy dejando, voy a ir hablando de todas maneras, ¿vale? vale. Gracias. Ok, so um, Google slides are great, but there's this glitch that they have to fix. There's a bug. I probably should file it, so they fix it. Um, basically, uh, así, pero puedes apagar el micro, que te oigo aquí un montón. Gracias. So, so basically, as you saw, everything started um, in Germany. Uh, my German colleagues in Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is a newspaper based out of Munich, um, they got a tip from an anonymous source, John Doe, saying, hey, do you want data? And the obvious answer is, yes, I want data, of course, right? Well, actually, that answer was not that obvious. John Doe did a statement, a manifesto, a couple of weeks ago um, that you can read in our website at icij.org, and saying that he had approached several big media organizations that had not paid attention to him. He had approached WikiLeaks that had not paid attention to him. So kudos to my German colleagues, Bastian and Frederick Obermeier. They're not related, but they have the same last name, pretty much the same last name, working at Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, who actually answered that first message from John Doe. And I think that normally the way journalists work with things like this, when you get an exclusive, when you get a hold of exclusive documents, what we normally do is we hold on to them and we don't want to share it with anybody. Because what we want is credit, we have big egos in journalism, and actually what we want to do is we want to have the front page of the paper. So I've been describing this 
um, as you know, I think the best way to describe this is golem journalism, right? You get a leak, somebody tells you you want data, and you say, yes, I want data, I want my 2.6 terabytes of data, and you hold on to the ring, and you don't want to share it because it's your treasure, and you don't want to share it with anybody, right? And it's fine, it's how journalism has worked, I'm not criticizing it, but 2.6 terabytes of data, connections to more than 200 countries, that's, you're not able to do it by yourself. Um, so instead of doing it by themselves, what they decided to do is to come to us at the ICIJ, which is a small, small team, so that we could share it with reporters all around the globe. ICIJ is based out of Washington, D.C., although we have a global team, and I like to compare ourselves to a startup because we're a very small team that grows and it's scaling up. Um, as we go, and I hope to be bigger. I hope to come here next year and tell you how, how much we've grown and all the things that we've done with this small team. Basically, we have um, the director, the deputy director out of Washington, a US-based team of just you know three people, the data and research unit, which were six people based between Latin America and Europe, and then we also have somebody um, that is based out of Washington that also works with African partners. Um, talking to them and working with them uh, in French. As you can see, we're a very small team of 12 people, but our team grows a lot. What we do is we go knocking on doors of The Guardian in the UK, the BBC, Le Monde in France, here in Spain in El Confidencial and La Sexta. We go and knock on the doors of Fusion and Univision in the States, knock on doors in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, and we build big teams of reporters from all these media organizations to work together on a project. So I would say that we are the equivalent of the United Federation of Planets, where we have our big you know, um, starship enterprise, right? And we go traveling through planets and talk to them and get them to work together. And we built this big team of more than 370 journalists in around 80 countries to work together on this project for a year. And it's the biggest team that has collaborated ever in journalism history, too. I was here to talk about tech, right? I haven't forgotten about it. But I want to sh show you my tech team. These three heroes and everything you're about to see has been developed by these three people, OK? So we're kind of a startup, I would say. Um, the first thing thinking about you know, how to deal with 2.6 terabytes and how to deal with you know, these at a global scale is we need to operate how businesses operate. We need to operate the same way crime, organized crime operates. This is a network of organized crime. As you can see, everything is interconnected. There's a globality to everything disconnected to organized crime, a co multinational corporation. So if the world is global, we need to tackle issues at a global scale too in journalism. So that's why we build these big teams of people. Because after all, even if we use tech to help us mine these 2.6 terabytes, at the core of it is the reporters, it's the people trying to make sense of those 2.6 terabytes, right? So we try to build this big team that tackles the problem at a global scale and that works together in a team trusting each other. This is a photo of me doing trapeze. I like to show it because I like to show off and so you can see my great catch. Um, but also because I think that working in a team um, is, is pretty much like doing trapeze. I don't know if you've ever done it. I would recommend it. It's, I think it's a great experience. Um, basically, there's this moment, even though you have guides here and you know you're not going to die, um, there's a moment where you're just holding upside down and you just have to let go and hope that somebody catches you at the other end. And there's this leap of faith when you work with somebody else that you don't know that you always have to take, right? This is like a relationship, but with more than 370 people and people that you don't know, and they have different cultures that speak different languages. So how are you going to trust it, each other? You just have to take a leap of faith, like you would do when you jump out of the trapeze to do a catch, right? So I have to say, even though technology was key to the Panama Papers, to me, the biggest key here was trust. Without trust, nothing I'm going to say would have happened. And not only trust, but remember I was telling you that journalists, we have big egos. We also ask people to leave their ego at the door so that we can collaborate and you don't care so much about, I want to be in the front page, but we're all going to be in the front page together. 
So how do we build trust? Of course, we build tools that help you know, build that trust and that help us be in contact all the time. But we also have, have discovered that, hey, we are human beings. It's always have, good to have some physical interaction. Um, and we also do physical meetings. For this project, we did four physical meetings in different parts of the world, in Washington, in London, in Munich, and in Johannesburg. Um, not all the people attended all the meetings, but this is an example of uh, the Munich meeting, a photo of the Munich meeting back in September 2015, when we gather around 100 journalists all together in the same room for two days, so a conference like this, but just about the Panama Papers data, just to know what are the topics, how are we going to investigate this. We did trainings, hands-on trainings on the tools I'm about to show, so that we bonded with each other and so that we were all on the same page. And as you can see, yes, Working with you know, uh, tech people, we end up being a bit of you know, freaks. And the project was not called Panama Papers uh, until we published. It used to call, be called Prometheus. And uh, one of my developers loves Star Trek. Uh, surprise, surprise. And that's why, <laughs> that's why we call it Prometheus. So we have been working on Prometheus project for a year uh, thanks to uh, this technology. Um, but before I explain the technology, I want to give you a size of what we did. Uh, and what ended up happening, thanks to using the technology and to making this big team of journalists work for a year, mining the same data, we have a philosophy which is called radical sharing. So if we get something, everybody gets access to that something. So if we get 2.6 terabytes, everybody has access to that 2.6 terabytes. If we share and talk to each other, everybody talks to each other in the same place, in public. And I think that that's quite radical because if you look at corporations worldwide, sometimes they have problems with the London branch talking to the New York branch because, you know, even though we practice Gollum journalism, I would say like Gollum data work or Gollum, this is my knowledge and I don't want to share it work. It's pretty common in pretty much any, any market in the world right now. So we want to apply and apply the radical sharing to everything we do. And thanks to doing that, we ended up discovering and publishing in April 3rd how the world of offshore worked from the inside and how the offshore world tax havens were used by pretty much anybody in the world that was rich and powerful. We discovered how at least 29 people from the top 500 richest in the world were using Mossack Fonseca, which is this law firm that we had access um, to their data. We discovered that there were 140 politicians from more than 55 countries uh, connected to offshore companies and using offshore companies many times without disclosing them. So, for example, we had 12 world leaders um, that were in the data. One of them, the Prime Minister of Iceland, who had not disclosed that he had a company in a tax haven with his wife and actually had to resign after we published. We discovered how banks were actually in the middle of all and basically enabling the system. So how do we try to say, explain that to the world in journalism? Well, we do our articles. We also do interactives like this one where you could explore the names of the main stories of the politicians and the connections to the offshore world and what companies they had in tax havens. Uh, more stories, for example, exposing the real role of banks. We discovered that more than 500 banks um, had requested Mossack Fonseca to create around 16,000 companies in tax havens for their clients at a very special moment. If you looked at the data and you started analyzing the trends, you saw a big spike in 2005. The market plateaus, it goes down in 2010. Uh, you, we started looking at that and we were like, huh, what's interesting? Let's look at what was happening there at that moment in 2005. And funny enough, there was the a law in the European Union and the European Savings Directive that was coming into effect exactly in 2005 that was actually asking banks to withhold taxes to European citizens. But we also saw in a previous leak in HSBC that they were very aware of a loophole in the law. The banks only had to withhold tax if you were an individual, if you were a person. But if you were a legal entity, they didn't have to do it. So at least HSBC and some other banks we learned through the data and these documents were basically advising their clients, hey, 
you know, the best way for me not to have to withhold tax is why don't you create a company in Panama, put the account, the bank account in the name of a comp Panama company, and then I don't have to um, take ta tax out of your bank account. So interesting big spike, right? Um, so we started looking at different things that we could do with the data, trying to see how it connects with the economy and how it interconnects with our world, because economists say that the offshore world is basically a major driver of inequality, uh, of the big inequality that we live in in our worlds. And something else we also discovered, especially our colleagues from The Guardian, discovered how many properties in the UK were owned by uh, offshore companies, and that at least one in 10, or nearly one in 10, were from Mossack Fonseca. Mossack Fonseca, this Panamanian law firm that we had access to the pretty much all their data, basically um, is one of the top five players in the world and that does this type of thing. And even though you're, about, you're seeing many things that made headlines and that still make headlines a month and a half into publication, they are the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg because they're just one of the many, many, many players that do this in the world. So. This is, was the, you know, what ended up happening. You get 370 journalists excited. Uh, we work for a year. We publish all together. We become trending topic. And as I was saying, we're still talking about the Panama Papers today. People got mad about this. And it's not, for us, it's not just that we want to have front pages in the papers, but we also want people to react, we want politicians to react, we want policy changes because the main reason why we do this is to expose a problem that is basically hidden. So these are the streets of Iceland. Uh, the day after publication, they were mad about the fact that some of the government members had not disclosed um, their connections to tax havens. And as I was saying, the prime minister actually had to resign. In Iceland, there were people, you know, there was the, the, the prime minister, a minister, the president, I mean, pretty much half of Iceland was in the data, interesting enough. But anyway, how did we make all this happen? As I was saying, we needed to trust each other and physical meetings were a way, but we also needed to have our social network so that we could talk to each other, we could share what we had been finding, and we basically had an interaction space. So we developed or elaborated on a tool that was open sourced, was called Oxwall, was a social networking tool, open source social networking tool that basically we took on, we developed on, we made adjustments and built on some security. But that basically allowed us to have our private social network in our servers where people could just log in and basically have you know, a news feed, like a wall, like you would do on Facebook. People could also share, have a forum topics and you know, share things on a threaded communication way. They could also share links. They could also share uh, files. And basically, there was this big interaction space where people got to talk to each other despite being in different time zones and in different parts of the world and coming from different cultures. Uh, we called it the global iHub because it's this big space where everything interconnects. And as I was saying, all based on open source software. Uh, we have a small team and we are poor. Uh, I didn't say that we are a nonprofit media organization and our budget is $1.8 million annually, which may sound like a lot, but for a media organization, it's nothing. So basically, in everything we do, we try to save on costs, of course, but at the same time, uh, and that means also not trying not to get software that has a high cost, but also, we also try to work with open source software so that we could actually build on that and elaborate on that and make it and adjust it to our needs. So. This is one of the tools that we developed or implemented, um, and that was key for the collaboration to happen. We also built on some security features. So for example, uh, we built this two-step authentication, which was a revolutionary because, uh, for our members because nobody knew what two-step authentication was. I didn't know what two-step authentication was. So having to get them to download the Google Authenticator uh, in their phone, we did it through Google Authenticator, and get, having to get them to download the Google Authenticator in their phone and learn how two-step authentication worked was quite, of a, quite a challenge but we made it happen. Uh, so there are also some security features because as you may understand, 
security is one of our big concerns too. So on top of you know, getting people to talk to each other and collaborate with each other, we also, um, we also wanted people to get, to get their hands dirty looking at the 2.6 terabytes. What we did at the beginning at the data team at ICIJ was to sit down in front of the um, computer and in front of those 2.6 terabytes at the hard drive um, that had it, and we started looking at what was inside the leak so that we could see what were the tools that we could use to not only process that data, but also to put it in the cloud so that reporters from everywhere in the world could actually look in, at the data at the same time. Remember, radical sharing, right? So this is basically what was inside the 2.6 terabytes of data, these 11.5 million files. As you can see, a lot of emails. Um, there were also PDFs, images, so my heart was getting sadder and sadder and sadder because PDF images means I'm going to have to do a lot of work to process that so that people can see inside them these documents. And then there were also um, database files that I'll mention a bit more about that in a second. So the first thing we learned is bad news. Not everything is machine readable. We're going to have to process this. Um, so the first challenge was how not to die in this process of trying to, pro to process that, that many amount of files. Because of course, if we had to do it in a kind of like a, in a one only with one channel, with one line, it would take us forever. We worked on this for a year, and that's quite unusual in journalism. If we only needed a year to process this, we would have died in, in, in the process. And of course, my bosses would have kicked me, you know, would have, uh, you know, kick me out of the project and say, no, we need to do this faster. So it may sound simple to some of you. Uh, for us, it was quite a discovery to try to use the cloud and the power of the cloud to try to process this faster. We created this army of servers in Amazon that basically were temporary servers that we would set up just when we needed to process these documents. We set up a parallelized process um, where you know, we had a queue with all the documents that would go through all this army of servers through a different, you know, uh, a whole process uh, of uh, processing, process. Uh, and basically then it would go into Apache Solar um, once the text had been extracted. So basically the way it would go is it would get a file, it would see, it would think, the, the machine would think, okay, do I know how to extract the text, or do I know the file format, yes or no? If no, it would just keep it and put it like to think about it later. And then the next thing that machine would think is, OK, I know the file extension. Can I see the text inside? Can I extract it? Yes or no? If I can extract it, then OK. I extract it and I send it to Solar. If I don't, then I need to perform OCRing, right? And we used Tesseract to actually uh, extract the text um, to perform OCRing uh, in, in these many different um, image formats that we had. We had JPEGs, we had TIFFs, uh, we had PDFs. So we used Tesseract to OCR that text or those images, and then once the text was out, it would extract it and send it to Solar, index everything, or index it, send it to Solar, and then we had this big engine search engine that we could use. But of course, we journalists are not tech savvy, most of us. So we needed a nice user interface that would allow us to explore that index in an easy, searchable way. So we also used um, an interface that I'm going to talk about in a second. But of course, I forgot to say that much faster, much happier, my bosses say, yes. Thank you. Um, this is how it, the interface looked. We used another open source tool called B Project Blacklight. Um, Blacklight basically uh, was built and designed for libraries so that you would go into the library, like Columbia University Library has this. You would go in there and you, you have a search box. You, you search for your book, Harry Potter, and you get the results. And then you can see whether there are very Harry Potter editions. You can fast it to the left and so on. And this is pretty simple, pretty simple user interface, not very fancy, but it's great because anybody knows how to search in a search box, right? So my journalists found that very, very, very easy to use, very easy to interact, and um, without much training, of course, we did our manual and we did trainings and we answered questions in office hours so that people could come and learn uh, how to use it. But on top of that, basically, pretty much without much explanation, the majority of my users were able to, to do this. 
I, my, the majority of my users are in this side of the spectrum where it's like non-tech savvy journalists but are great journalists. They get stones to talk to themselves, to them, you know. They, they get anybody to give them secrets. But I also have people, users from in the other side of the spectrum where it's tech savvy journalists, journalists that know, data journalists, developers that request from me different types of um, tools and different types of skills and, and you know, they want to do more, more with our tools. So every time when we decide on a set of tools, we basically have to cater to these two this users, which are the non-tech savvy ones and the tech savvy ones. So the great thing about um, solar and black, black light is that it allowed us to do more complex things. So for example, complex or more advanced things than just searching. So it would allow for proximity searching, for example. So you could search Joaquin Loera proximity two, and you would get a result Joaquin Guzman Loera, right? Uh, I don't know if you know who that is, but just in case you don't remember, um, you know, El Chapo Guzman, one of the biggest um, drug traffickers in the world um, that was arrested recently and, yeah, and also interviewed by Sean Penn. Um, basically, um, not only you could, you know, do proximity searching, this also supports regular expression searching um, so that the advanced journalists could actually search for patterns, they could search for bank accounts. They could search for um, passports using, you know, regular expressions. Um, it also has an API, so you can also do calls in the API if you have it enabled. Uh, for ICIJ, only ICIJ reporters and users could use the API. We weren't able to enable it to the rest. But, and then it allows, you can build on this. And one of the things we built, for example, was reporters were like, hey, Mar, I really don't want to do all the work of like entering a search term, entering another search term. It's kind of like, you know, it would take me forever. Uh, I want to have a list of all the politicians in my country. I want to throw it to the system and I want to know whether there's, there are any hits. So uh, one of our developers, Matthew, developed this batch searching feature where a reporter would have a CSV, upload it to the system, and the system within seconds would give them back a spreadsheet with all the URLs if there was a hit an exact match or a proximity match. And then, of course, it's up to the reporter to go through all the links and rule out the false positives, but that was quite a good advancement. Um, so we also elaborated and, you know, built on what was already there in solar and black light. But as I was saying, inside the 2.6 terabytes, there were also database formats. And there were files from Mossack Fonseca's internal database their client database. It's basically the parallel corporate registry because as these tax havens, most of them don't have a public corporate registry or an accessible corporate registry. These became, you know, this parallel corporate registry where we learned who were the owners of more than 200,000 companies. So we had to do something with that. And as you can see, there is a big number of files. So no, we did not get a copy of it. SQL database, access database, in whatever format it was in, in, um, in uh, Mossack Fonseca's um, uh, headquarters. And we basically had to reconstruct the work. And we really knee knew that we wanted to put it in the cloud so that our reporters could explore it in a visual way. So when we're looking at tools, we discovered Lincurius, which is this great software that basically you get a license, you put it in your server, and once you plug data that is in Neo4j, just in seconds you have graphs easily visualized. So we had to reconstruct, do reverse engineering to reconstruct Mossack Fonseca's internal database. We put it in SQL Server. Once we had it in SQL Server, through Talent, uh, this open source ETL tool, we basically just converted it into Neo4j and bang, our reporters could search it in the cloud and could search anything they wanted. And for us, working with graphs and graph databases has been amazing. It's been kind of like jumping into the future and feeling like we had superpowers all together and that we can un understand this network of people and companies in a better way. Um, than we were able to do before. Because before, what we used to do is you search documents and you have a piece of paper and you go like, Mar is connected to Alvaro, is connected to, you know, and that is our graph 
you know, how we used to do graph analysis. And the world works in graphs. I mean, Facebook is the best example of how the world works in graphs, but we're all, all interconnected, right? And I'm connected to my cousin, my cousin is connected to blah, and the world works like that, but also the way investigators look into the world is like that too. Because, you know, when you look into a politician, so for example, let's say the former minister of industry in Spain that was actually, you know, in the data and that resigned a week after the revelations of the Panama Papers, you know, you want to look at him, you want to look at who else was in that company, uh-huh, his brother, and there's a signature, uh-huh. And then, okay, that Bahamas company, there's also a company, a parallel company in the UK with the same name, interesting. And who is behind that company? Aha, uh -huh. another company in Jersey. Well, all that are, is graphs, right? So graph technology has been key for us to do better investigative journalism and uncover um, this mass of data that we had. Remember, what we were able to do with graphs was just the structured data part or the part that had to do with the Mossack Fonseca's internal, internal database. But for my reporters, it was magic. Right? What was magic? They were like, oh my God, I can go make a search. I see a dot in my screen. I can double click on the dot and then I get to see the networks and find people that I had missed while looking at the documents. Nodes, of course, but for us, node and edges is not dots. Dots and lines, that kind of the dots. Um, and um, they were like, oh my God, there's fuzzy searching. So I basically can type in a name and I'm from Finland, this is a real case. I'm from Finland, I type in a name, and I found more people, because of course, Finnish names have, in some cases, you know, um, you know, a same type, and you know, I found more Finnish people, thanks to this fuzzy searching feature. And you know, oh my God, I can get a dot here, and a dot here, and I could know whether these two dots are connected just by clicking on a button, amazing. The find the shortest path feature is a built-in feature in Linkurio. So, you know, the reaction was pretty positive about my users. Of course, remember, I'm cutting to this side of the spectrum. So this side of the spectrum is thinking we do magic. But this side of the spectrum can also do other more technical things. So, for example, Linkurio supports cipher queries, which is um, the querying language of Neo4j. So you could also try to look at, you know, who is the biggest intermediary? What is the most connected company? You could look at... I want to look at exp expand all the gra all the network around this person and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it also allows you to do public widgets, so you can have this. Everything is under a password protection and in our own servers, but reporters can also publish their visualization and embed it in their website. So that was pretty handy. And then it also you can also tap into the API and you know get the data somewhere else if you want, like we later did with our public database that I'm going to mention in a second. Um, so on May 9th, there was another big step, another big milestone in our project. We published all these stories uh, thanks to the use of this technology, thanks to my reporters going crazy using this technology, um, thanks to the fact that we used um, the data in a way where we could find all these great stories. And that was in April 3rd. But around a month later, in May 9th, in May 9th at 8 p.m. Malaga, uh, we actually published or republished the Offshore Leaks database. This website was living in our website, in, you know, has been living since 2013, but we wanted to publish as much of the Panama Papers data as possible. We knew from the beginning we were not going to publish the 11.5 million files because there's a lot of private information, passports, bank accounts, information that, from people that needs to be uh, protected. But we knew that if we were exposing a secret system, we needed to help with the transparency of that system. And as I was saying at the beginning, having corporate corporations that are basically hidden is not the way normally the world works, right? So the, there's a big international consensus from experts that basically Corporate information needs to be public in a public registry. So we think of offshore leaks, the ICAJ offshore leaks database of the public registry of some tax havens and basically publish the information of the more than 200,000 companies that were connected to Mossack Fonseca and we added that to the more than 100,000 company from this previous leak, offshore leaks from 2013 and now we have what I think it is the biggest uh, search engine of uh, offshore, tech, uh, offshore companies 
uh, and the people behind them uh, in one place uh, in this website. And there is basically another search box uh, where you can actually also then filter. And, um, and then basically you can get results and find stories. So for example, the Times in London looked for names and found Emma Watson. Sorry, sorry, Harry Potter fans. Uh, they found Emma Watson, and Emma Watson was connected to a company uh, in a tax haven um, that actually owned her house. And she said it was because she didn't want to disclose where she was living. Um, but the fact is that she did it through a tax haven. Um, so you can find many, many more stories in a regular way of, hey, there's a dot here, and I double click, and I expand it, and I find a story. But I know you guys and girls. Um, don't want to just expand dots. You know what nodes are, you know what edges are, you know how to query Cypher probably. So I would say there's also a download version. Uh, you can download the data, the database in CSVs. You can also download the data uh, in Neo4j. We've made a special Neo4j package where you download Neo4j, this Neo4j package and the data is already in, in there. So you could actually you know, just start querying the data straight away. If you find any nice stories, please tell me, I'd love to get more stories out, um, or publish the stories yourselves. I think that right now it's become a moment where it's not just us investigating the Panama Papers, it's the world investigating the Panama Papers. And I think for me this is the most exciting part, where we get the world to look into it and keep exposing stories. I didn't want to um, leave uh, this talk or finish this talk without saying that the teamwork for us, not only works with reporters and reporters and programmers working together, but also works us teaming with you know, uh, technology companies. We've teamed up with Neo4j to work on this. We've teamed up with all these software companies that you see there and that sometimes give us the software for free or give us advice or, give, or, or train us so that we could do better work. So if I've said something that you think, hey, yeah, my tool, my company would be great for you, come and see me afterwards. And as I was saying, also, we are kind of poor, uh, and we actually rely on, rely on donations from big foundations to survive, and we also rely on, on donations from people. So if you think that what I said was exciting and you think that we should keep doing this, you can donate your time, you can help us with your technology, or you can also donate money. In our website, donate.icij.org, we receive donations. We actually received more than $100,000 in donations. Um, after the Panama Papers, and thanks to that, we're going to be able to keep doing our work. With that, I want to finish and say that this is the end, or maybe not, you know. A year ago, we were actually talking about one of the biggest tech projects we were doing with HSBC, and a year later, I'm talking about the biggest journalism leak in history. I hope to be here again next year, talking to you about the next biggest big journalism leak in history. Thank you. Well, fan fantastic chat. Um, if you've got any questions, now's the time. Okay, can I ask a question here? Um, just for clarity, can you define what an offshore company is? So, Because yes. I think it's a very uh, overused and misunderstood term. Great. It seems like you're knowledgeable, so help me out if you think I'm not very clear. But basically, so... There are places considered tax havens, uh, which are places that don't comply with exchange of information, basically, with other nations. Um, the problem has been that the OECD has taken out many places out of the tax haven list, and now there are only two tax havens uh, in that list, which is not, not real. So basically, offshore, uh, we talk about offshore jurisdictions that depending on the legislation of the place, of the country, is a tax haven or not, and that has implications in, you know, um, in, you know, in, in back home with taxes. But basically, offshore companies would be set up in places that have, provide low taxes or that provide some opacity, secrecy around uh, how they've been created. So for example, Spain operates as an offshore jurisdiction in some areas. There's this type of companies called Edves that basically uh, provide low taxes for international um, corporations. But normally, offshore companies are these companies created in tax havens in these places with uh, low taxes or where you know, 
having any information about tax haven, about the ownership uh, or the people behind it is, is very, very difficult. So we've been defining offshore companies and the offshore world um, pretty much in that way. Why would you set up an offshore company? Well, you've been set up an offshore company to create this parallel identity that would allow you to hide uh, and to show that you're not, you know, that, that, that you're not behind that company. And then with that company, you can basically go to um, Switzerland to create a bank account. You can actually get, you know, a property in London. You can also get a mortgage. So basically, it's a way you go. You would go to Panama, or you would go to um, to, to the British Virgin Islands to have this parallel identity where nobody can trace you back to it. Of course, it's very important to say that having a company offshore, it's perfectly legal. There are many legal uses for offshore companies, um, and we're not implying in anything we're saying or in any of our stories that anybody was doing anything illegal. However, our uh, investigations in the past years have shown that. Many of the users connected to the offshore world have to do with secrecy and to hide for some reason. Um, so we, you know, and economists say it has a big implications in the economy uh, and the economy, global economy. So that's why we've been covering them. I hope it's clear. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Um, you talk about security. Uh, I'm curious that it wasn't clear to me. Who were you protecting, uh, trying to protect your data? Because I assume, knowing a little bit about security, I assume with the organization as big as that, any major uh, intelligence agency not only had a copy of your data, but a uh, copy of your communication on this social network in real time. So what I didn't understand, why didn't you just put it public right away? Why didn't you decide to work on it uh, for a year and not crowdsource? Um, processing this data from the beginning. Okay, so I see your two questions. You have two questions in your question. And the first is, of course, at the beginning of the investigation, we started doing a threat modeling analysis of like, okay, who is our who is our enemy, right? And we actually decided that governments were not our enemies in this in this sense because it's not like we're analyzing NSA data. Uh, we're analyzing data that. If governments had got a copy of it, you know, they would be happy and they would, because, you know, of course, it's their job to see whether these people are paying taxes or not, right? Um, so basically, um, once we decided that the NSA was not our, you know, our, our enemy, then we decided that we could go with cloud-based solutions, we could go with Amazon, we could actually just, just needed, needed to protect our servers and our platforms, you know, with you know, um, SSL, you know, like being served on SSL and also kind of like providing some other logging, um, more secure logging um, into our platforms and so on. I'm not the super security expert, but basically that was a big step that, that basically knowing that the NSA, and if the NSA hacked us, you know, it would be bad, but it's not the end of the world because again, you know, actually in the end, the, some governments have access to part of this data uh, as far as we know, not from us. It's just, you know, they have received part of this data else from and other sources. So, so for us, it was important that, you know, it was served over SSL, that it was not just straightforward logging, that, you know, that we monitor traffic and that we use some, you know, also auditing of the platforms and the tools so that there were no holes in the software. Um, and the second question that, that you were saying, it was, you, you, your question really was, if you put all the data out ah, publicly Korea, from yes. the beginning. So, so, so we knew there was public interest in the story when we got the data. We did initial research to see that there was public interest and there was a story. We don't publish ever or work on every single leak we get or any, any single story idea that we get. So we do initial research. And we did initial research and we, found, we thought it was a story. But we needed to keep exploring the public interest and to see what stories were out there. So we decided that we wanted to do this in a private way so that journalists who are specialist investigators looked into, the, you know, into this and curated the content, basically. Um, as I was saying, we, after we learned a bit more about the data, we knew straight away we were not going to publish the 11.5 million files because we knew that there was a lot of private information that from ethical and legal reasons we don't want to publish into the internet. 
Um, so we didn't want to publish passports. We didn't want to publish bank accounts. We didn't want to publish personal information from some people. Um, there, there are information like, yeah, copies of passports and bank accounts. So we knew that we didn't want to publish those, those whole documents. So the only way that we could think of is, okay, let's get the biggest team of journalists possible. And then is there anything that we can open up to the public? And that's when we published the, uh, the companies. And from a journalistic perspective, could we have published the companies before? Yeah, but it's very difficult because then it makes it very difficult to investigate in silence. I think that a lot of the work we, have, we do is actually work quietly so that we can talk to sources and people talk to us. And um, had Mossack Fonseca known a year ago that we had all this, maybe we would not have been able to work on it. So that's why we published the database portion after the information was out. Also, our legal advice was, okay, why don't you publish th these stories, set up precedent that it's, you know, it's interesting data and that it stayed in the public interest, and then we'll have a stronger case also to make this data public. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last quick question. Or what, can we go to two and I'll answer them quickly? Uh, uh -huh. First of all, congrats, I really admire your uh, work. My question is not uh, so related with the technology behind this leak, but it's more related with your opinion about something. So nowadays we see lots of movements growing. You guys, Anonymous, everybody is trying to fight against the establishment. But I reached to a point that it seems that we are fighting against the beast much worse than the Hydra. So is any of these things that are happening are really making any difference? Because we put away one enemy and one million grows uh, where the other one was. So it seems that we are, well, we already lost the war, so. Okay, can I get the other one and I answer the two of them together? And then I'll be here, there for questions later. There was a question here. Thank you. Uh, having said that there is a lot of important information in, in the document that you have, how you can store that secure and, 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 and giving the security to the people that appears in the, those documents, that your leak is not gonna leak? Mm -hmm. okay. how, how you can be so secure? Okay, so I'm gonna start with that one. Um, as I was saying, we've been um, trying to use some secure, internal security measures and we have active monitoring uh, to know how is our data being accessed. So we've tried to secure our data as much as possible. Um, and so far, as far as I know, of course, I mean, I guess, you know, you're never, never, ever, ever super, super, super secure. But we've tried to use our uh, best security advice, uh, talking to security experts to try to secure the data. Um, and that's the best we can do. I don't want to leak with an, inside the leak. Uh, and as far as I know, that has not happened yet. Uh, and as I was saying, for us right now, it's very important also to monitor the activity. So we're monitoring any activity and having alerts also around the fact whether do we get any suspicious activities around our platforms. Um, and you can look at the world like, hey, I cannot change anything. Or you can look at the world with this other view of like, maybe I can do something, you know, even though I'm a small individual. Of course, if you're an individual and then you join forces with other 400 individuals, you get, a, you know, you get more power. And that's what we tried to do at ICIJ. I think that this project has not only caused public debate, uh, I think that it's also moving politicians and policymakers into action. I think we knew about tax havens, um, and it's not a secret, but it's true that there was the lack of political will um, to do something about them, and it seems that Thanks to the Panama Papers, there have been some policy actions that are starting to take place. So for example, some uh, jurisdictions have started to say that they're gonna store information about beneficiaries uh, of companies, not just in registries of tax havens, also in our own registries. In, Madrid, in Spain, you cannot know who's the real owner of a company because that information is not stored in the registry. Um, same in the UK, and so there's this big movement around the recording of beneficial owner beneficial owner information that is being pushed thanks to the Panama Papers, as I'm told by, by, by the uh, people that are pushing for that, the activists that are pushing for that. There's also um, more, informa or more negotiations that are happening in terms of exchange of information between nations. Um, David Cameron announced a registry of ownership behind companies, uh, behind properties that are owned by companies in tax havens. Uh, so I think that, and then there's also another big topic, which is corporations are big users of the system. 
And there's this big push that has been trying to happen of country by country reporting so that you know if you're a multinational corporation, Telefonica, for example, and you have subsidiaries in tax havens, what are these subsidiaries in tax havens doing? And we don't know that with the current reporting. And we've been told that this project has been helping also on that policy changes too. So I think that we try to put the focus on the spotlight on a public issue, an issue of global concern, and you know, then help others uh, do push for policy changes. And in this case, we're still yet to see the re real outcome, but the initial things that have been happening seem quite promising. Thank Pretty you very much. Thank you. Marcal, ladies and gentlemen.